All right, our next session is the chemistry of coffee. You briefly met Carl earlier, but here's a little bit more about Carl. Carl's been an active industry leader in the food and beverage industry for the past 40 years. In addition to his global business outlook and perspective, he brings a vast knowledge in process engineering, business and product development, customer service, and strategy development to the coffee, beverage, and cocoa industry. He's worked for global companies such as Alpha Laval, a Swedish multinational group, and served as the president and member of the board of the Probat group of companies, including Probat Burns, in the North American market from 1989 to 2016. Hello, Carl. We're going to start with this, the sustainability and what we're looking at here uh, in talking about chemistry in coffee, which is a subject that we're teaching. And it's basically, I mean, it's taking us a week for, for the subject and from one of the semesters. I mean, it is, it's its material for an entire semester in, in, uh, in, in college. Uh, so please bear with me um, uh, when I'm talking about in some sessions or in some segments as too nerdy of stuff, I mean, uh, to, to present. But uh, I apologize for that, but I'm trying to make it as, as, uh, as clear as possible. What you're looking at here is the, uh, the a wonderful product created by nature, sustainable through photosynthesis. And uh, when, we're, when we're looking at the photosynthesis define it, which is basically responsible for the growth of the plant, then we're looking at carbon dioxide plus water and energy which then, which then form the uh, carbohydrates and plus oxygen. Uh, in, in, in I, I'm basically skipping over the equation, what it means in chemistry of, uh, of growing this plant, but you're taking basically uh, six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules, which are converted by light and energy, captured by chlorophyll, which is in the, in the, in the uh, equation uh, shown by, by an error. And all of that we're converting into sugar molecules and six oxygen molecules. Why do I say that? Because we will come back in the chemistry of coffee, we'll come, always come back to carbon, to carbon, um, um, uh, to carbon, to the molecules, to the oxygen, to the um, uh, hydrogen uh, molecules or, or components that include all of that uh, in order to understand what the, the, uh, the little coffee bean as converter uh, is providing to us. Uh, while we're uh, processing uh, the coffee. What you're looking at here is the green coffee. We really cut through the beans. We wanted to show when you cut through beans, this very healthy looking quality bean and the quality of coffee depends on certainly, I mean, the, the, the quality the, uh, in the bean itself. You're looking at the thin uh, wax layer the embryo, the mucilage, the silver skin, which is then later also called the chaff and parenchyma. Um, all of this, this contributes in a healthy bean to the quality, the quality of the roast, of the, of the, of the coffee, which is basically the major determinant for aroma and taste development during the roasting process. There is not such a thing like the optimal roast. The roast master, the roast master is basically the master, the controller of the quality of the coffee, of the flavor and the aroma development. He or she knows what, what they can develop and how they can develop through designing this profile. They know when they roast the coffee, if they want to result in a sweet floral or bread or nutty character through a, a, a normal roast or they have a medium dark roast or maybe a darker roast where they're looking for flavor components like more spicy phenolic ashy dark or ro a roast in, in the roast flavor and and and, and this says this says it just let's let's go to the to, to the process of roasting just to recall it what what uh, what we're looking at? What constituents do we have available for when we're charging a roaster with coffee? You see here again the the, the bean, the structure with the skin, the pulp, and bean silver skin, um, uh, pergamino, 
and 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 that is all within this coffee bean that is being presented to us but look at the constituents that we're in. 55 to 60 percent are carbohydrates we're going to get to those we have 11 percent of protein we have six to twelve percent of oil and 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 acid lipids uh, and and other lipids sorry water 10 to 13 percent free water that is available to us and the importance we get to 15 to 20 percent of acids and then the new nutrients in the green coffee, um, all of which are very important, um, inclu including, and last but not least, the so-called alkaloids, of which one is the very important, and is basically the reason that we're drinking coffee, is caffeine. Now, what does it all do in, in the roasting process? This is a very simplified uh, chart or um, a schematic that shows what happens. We're charging a roaster at a charging temperature, depending on the roast quality. The, the, the coffee, the green coffee itself, and, and Mike will talk about green coffee and the agricultural part and the, po uh, 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 the, the uh, post uh, uh, processing after picking, but we're charging the roast with, with a batch of, of, of coffee and, and applying an energy to the, to the coffee. Air is roasting coffee, but we're having we, we're talking about sev several different um, uh, energy supplies to the coffee. One is and the most important is convection, and second thing is conduction, and the third one is radiant. Radiant is kind of a minor heat uh, process or uh, application to the coffee um, because radiant means with no contact. Now, no matter what roaster we have and what technology we apply, the, the majority of, of the uh, coffee that being roasted obviously is convection. It's a forced convection and then conduction. Ideally, we want the conduction uh, process to happen from bean to bean, uh, but the majority will be uh, convection. However, it is very important to control those both, both heat trans, uh, transfers to the, uh, to the coffee. What you see here, once you charge the roaster and you're coming around the turning point and then you walk up the defined time temperature profile, during that time, as soon as you come around the turning point and you hit, and you hit the lower tail end of this profile that you designed, that's where it starts to become really interesting and for all the chemical reactions to happen. Here is where the roast master decides how fast he passes through these moments, through these segments of, of allowing the chemical reactions to happen and, and develop the compounds for flavor and aroma all the way to the first crack after which then the development starts of the coffee. That means the more flavor and aroma compounds and the longer the time we, or, or the, the, the time we have given the chemical reactions to happen, the more we have basically available at the end, at, that means after the first crack in order to develop the coffee. I'm just bringing this as, an, as this profile up there for recording. This is what we're dealing with. We're gonna get a little bit more or by way more detailed into the chemical reactions and come back uh, uh, to a similar chart. The, uh, the, the most important criteria is no matter how, no matter what coffee technology or roasting technologies you basically apply, important is, if you make comparison, is the, the, certainly the quality of coffee, but also the time um, of, the, of the, roast, the roasting time itself. And last but not least, it is the end temperature which is related to a color of the roast. It's certainly the end temperature, but more so the color of the roast. You can have a long roast with an end temperature of let's say 410 degrees. You can have a shorter roast with an end temperature of 410 degrees. In all cases, we need to look at the color. And in all cases, you, you may get, or you most likely get different aroma 
and, and, and flavor profiles or aromatics that you develop during this process, because it's depending how fast you're going through the chemical reaction phase of the roasting profile. Here are the various, uh, and then if we, if we comparing what we have in the green coffee chemistry, just with reference to the earlier chart, what we have available to us, aside from caffeine, between Arabica and Robusta, as you can see, Robusta has a higher con caffeine content, but the carbohydrates are pretty much in the same, in the same range. Some, during the roasting, some of those, not all of them, uh, are being converted or we're doing anything to them, but we focus on ma mainly on the carbohydrates because the carbohydrates, those are the sugar components and sugar, sugar is the most important precursor of all the flavor com compounds and acidities or the acids that we're develop developing during the roast. Now, if we like it or not, but our green people, green coffee people, they know by way more about that. And certainly, again, Mike, Mike uh, Ebert will talk about that. But we're getting already, when we're buying, when we're purchasing beans, then they had already, they went through a certain process, a post-picking process. And, and depending on this post-picking process, we already getting coffees with certain traits and notes. Like for example, when you take the parchment, which is the parchment dried coffee, which delivers a little bit more acidity um, um, and, um, and, and si the, the simple sugars are, are kind of, I mean, washed out. In the, in the, in the pulp dried coffee, with, with the, uh, have a lower, generally known as the lower acidity um, and uh, with bigger body, in the fruit dried coffee, you got like the, the, the red fruit with a big body and more earthy note. And then the sun dried, which is also known for uh, the, uh, the, the earthy and more uh, a, a spicy note on that. The, the interesting part, what we also know from the coffee origins, like for like the, the African coffee with, with their... Um, um, uh, the strong and rich flavor, interesting flavor with bright acidity, uh, maybe except for the Ethiopian coffee, which have a delightful, beautiful uh, flavor. Um, um, and then you have, on the other hand, you have like Brazilian coffee, which are, I mean, very nice and, and excellent for blending. The biggest challenge is for for, or, or they lend themselves for blending. But the biggest challenge for a cuppa or a coffee taster is to really try to develop your own kind of library of learning about the different traits, the different flavors of coffee. It takes a long time to become a qualified cuppa uh, in, 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 in this uh, coffee uh, cupping or in this coffee environment and, and learning about coffees. I mean, if, if you for looking at if the, just the numbers of flavors that we're talking in, in coffee um, of over 850 defined in green coffee, which we're basically doing roast even, even uh, developed further. But bear in mind, a, 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 a beer has maybe 250. Um, wine has 500. Roasted coffee has over 1,000. And and, and 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 it's taking a long time for for green coffee uh, uh, for a cuppa of coffee to learn the traits and understand the the the, the nuances that we're looking for. We're going to back back here to the uh, the roasting and flavor in order to stand really the big picture of uh, of the chemistry of that. We need to understand the physical changes that go through. Now, as earlier I mentioned. There is free water available. Green coffee has between, uh, let's say, nine and twelve percent of water content. Free water. The the physical changes, with reference to evaporation, the boiling of water, the moisture and inside the bean, 
very important com uh, 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 component and, and, and reaction to understand. The chemical reaction forming uh, new, uh, new substances within the bean, important to understand. Chemical reaction breaking down substance within the bean is, is another one. And if, if we're going on, that the state of, of matter and phase change, the atoms, the molecules, the compound families, and the taste, the chemical reaction, the acids, and last but not least, the pH that we're basically trying to determine in, a, in, a, in, the, um, in the cup of coffee, all of that is very important to understand. And this is what we're focusing on. And this is what we're, we're going to go a little bit more into detail. So talking about the free water inside and around the beans, we're exposing the bean to, to the, the, uh, the airflow, uh, uh, which is uh, convection air. And, and certainly on the other hand, conduction air during the roast. And first of all, the free water that is available is absorbed by the airflow that we're applying to the beans. So there's enough, there's enough airflow to pick up the water and that's the so-called evaporation process. Um, once once we, we, we went through um, th this evaporation process and have absorbed the, 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 the water and being able to enter now with the continuous uh, heat uh, 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 process and, 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 um, and delivery to the beans, we're now slowly heating up the, the, the center of the beans and or going into the center of the beans. So saying, for example, that the beans is roasted from outside, inside, uh, that's not exactly true. We're depending incredibly, I mean, we're depending on the water inside the bean. We need to heat up the water to a, a point that the water inside the bean is, is boiling and is now we're changing the face, as you can see here, the face to like the gas or vapor. So at that point in time, we cross the line of 100 degrees C or 220 degrees F, and we're now within the in the uh, in the in the gas or in the in a vapor situation. We're, we're talking about uh, vapor vaporization, and this is we go on since we're continuously adding temperature or energy to the coffee. We're increasing the temperature in the bean higher than the 100 degrees C. In, in, the, in the vaporization station, 120 degrees C and higher. And this allows us now to break down the, chemi the chemicals, the, the chemical constituents inside the beans all the way to the, to the center. And this is going to help us, this process, with the amount of air that we're basically sending to the, to the coffee beans or into the batch, the velocity that crosses the beans, and the temperature that we're holding inside, keeping the um, the, the water in an, uh, or the, the in the in the vaporization station, that helps us to roast the beans, breaking down the constituents from the inside, and helps us to roast the beans from the inside. Uh, so all the substances, the substance that we're converting, works it the, the opposite now the opposite way to, from the heat and air that's being uh, uh, going through the. Um, the, the, the outside shell into the center of the bean. <clears throat> now, uh, we have about, in, in all the flavor comp compounds, all the flavor components that we're, that we're basically looking at, that's about 20, 30, 28 to 30 of them. We're best characterizing and, 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 and reducing our aromas that we can talk and can perceive um, in, in, um, uh, in our palate um, down to six, down to six, what you see here. The sweet, the sweet or caramel, the, the roasty flavors, the fruity flavors, spicy, smoky, and earthy. And, and when we take this further, then this type of flavor profile or these flavor constituents, they, we'll find that in, when we go to cupping. How do we cup? We cup by elimination. We know we basically 
elimination means we can we can pick up sweetness, we can pick up saltiness, we can pick up sour, and we can pick up bitter. All of those we do we do cup by elimination in order to find the constituents that lead to uh, uh, to these uh, flavor and aroma profiles. In order to understand them further, what that means is we got to understand the molecular structure of those compound and families in order to come up with a taste. We need to know how they work. We need to understand what's an atom. What, how is it charged? Is it positive or a negative charge, negatively charged? Is it, one, is it one or two that are combined? Or is it two that would have to be separated? All of that is very important to understand understanding the, 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 uh, uh, the, the coffee chemistry. And when we know that, then we understand how these flavor or taste profiles, how can we uh, allocate them to the various sweetness, uh, the sweetness, like the sweet profiles, like for example, what, what is sweetness, what we're finding, sucrose, fructose, and, 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 and glucose. What is a simple sugar? When we get to this, and what is an, what is an, 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 um, an reduced sugar? Is sugar tasting different from honey and honey different from candy? That is what the same thing when it comes to sourness. Is it vinegar has a different sourness and appearance or a, a feeling, mouth feeling, than lemon and, and, and limes and, and yogurt? And that goes also. This, you're going to see this. You're going to see this chart several times uh, during the next uh, uh, time, during the next uh, few minutes uh, to define saltiness, bitterness, and umami. Those are very important. Where do they come from? Where do these components um, uh, and, and molecules uh, come from, and how do they develop? In order to to for that to understand, first of all, let's define the carbohydrates. Remember. The, the incredible uh, amount of carbohydrates, which are basically consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a, in a ratio of one to two to one. Carbohydrates can be defined as monosaccharides, monomers. Monosaccharides means one sugar unit, simple sugars. And they are defined as fructose, glucose, galactose, arabinose. Then we got the disaccharides or oligosaccharides that those are the sugars that like is sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Now I've got to say here, sucrose is the simple sugar is table sugar. Sucrose is a non, it's a, it's a, 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 a non-reducing sugar. And, and what are we going to do with that? Sucrose is abundantly available within in the green bean and will play a, a major role in caramelization. And last but not least, we have within the family of carbohydrates, we have polysaccharides. And those are galactose, cellulose, and starch. And they play a big role. However, they play more a role within the shell than the actual structure of the plant or of the coffee bean. That's where the polysaccharides means poly means many of them, many of, of of, of sim, uh, single sugars are being combined to align to a chain of, of, uh, of, of sugars, which is called the, the uh, polysaccharides. Now, um, the, um, with all of those, we're defining the flavors and aromas that come off. I'm skipping this here because it, it's, it's going to come again a little bit later, but all of those, what all of the phenolic flavors, the, the, what are, do, the, do the hydrocarbons, I mean, cause? The pyrroles, the furans, the pyrazines, all of them will be developed during this, uh, during the, uh, the um, uh, reaction, uh, chemical reaction stages coming around the turning point of roasted and, and walking our way up to the, to the first, uh, for the first crack. But in order to really, really uh, understand what, what that means, we got to basically recall the types or the four most important types of chemical reactions, in particular in the field of operation that we are in, roasting coffee. 
there's first of all there's the uh, the, uh, the, the the synthesis um, which which has an, an, uh, the, the definition and you have basically two uh, two different um, molecules and they we want them to to uh, to combine uh, to one. This is the that's the the the, the uh, form of 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 synthesis and um, the the actual definition is that the synthesis reactions are reactions of different atoms or molecules interact molecules or compounds. Most of the time, when a synthesis reaction occurs, energy is released and reaction is exotherm. Next one is the um, a, a, a decomposition, um, which basically has a molecule, and is to one or the other way of uh, um, reaction separates both of them. Um, this can be done through oxidation. This can be done to uh, 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 degrade the, the degradation um, and other forms of separating uh, a molecule. Single uh, displacement means that there's a molecule with another one, but they want to, because of the, 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 the uh, um, electric charge, they may, for example, be attracted so that A is attracted more to C than to be, and there will be exchanged. And that is similar to the double displacement. But all of, all of these displacements, as we're looking at them here, they, um, they play a very important role in the, uh, in the, in the chemical, uh, in the chemical uh, uh, reactions during the roasting. So the, um, uh, Here is another way of, uh, of looking at those four uh, different types and the way what plays their role, knowing about what we're trying to do about the molecules, singular or double or exchanging one with another one requires functions or processes that are known like oxidation and degradation, decompositions, breakdowns, all of that is, is uh, uh, processes that, that take place. Oxidation, remember from chemistry, oxidation is someone that, that basically gives an, an electron and, and um, reduction is a component that accepts the electron. Um, these are the these are oxidation processes that we have several of those going on during the roasting and certainly then the degradation the process by which a, a substance is broken down through either hydrolysis um, or even oxidation and then you have the, the, the decomposition of chemical breakdown uh, in the process in fact to, to effect of simplifying a single chemical, entity into two or more fragments. Um, I'm pointing these out, these out, out because of there are to, that it's, it's important to understand we're spending on, on these type of reactions in our, in our teaching, in our classes here, uh, one or two days on, on those functions and taking each and, and every compound apart and defining uh, which one is being uh, process, which one is uh, uh, being uh, treated or processed uh, to meet any of these four uh, important uh, uh, reactions. Uh, in, in order to really what we're going towards understanding all of that, we're now going to really define the components that play a role in the next process. Once we understand the, the chemical reactions, Important now is we're going towards the so-called um, uh, 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 mylite reaction. For to understand the mylite reaction, we need to know about the sugars that play a role, and those are the 
reducing and non-reducing sugars. And before we do that, let's talk about the aldehydes. Is any class of organic compounds in which a carbon atom shares a double bond with an oxygen atom? And I'm, I'm, I'm really want to focus on that. It's the definition of a double bond, as you can see down below, on an, with, an, with an oxygen atom, a single bond with an hydrogen atom, and a single bond with another atom of a group or atoms. The double bond between carbon and oxygen is characteristic of all aldehydes and is known as the carbonyl group. And as you can see, there's a difference between the aldehyde and, and the, uh, and the uh, ketone. Uh, those are very important uh, structures, formulas, to understand the difference between a reducing and a non-reducing sugar. That brings us to the, to the next. And then we're looking at the most abundant sugar within, within the process is simple sugar, abundantly available, which is the so table sugar. And it is a non-reducing sugar. It is immediately available for, for processing. During roasting, it decomposes by heat uh, and, and treatment application. And the sugar will be dehydrated during the early stages of the roast and, de and then hydrolyzes and into reducing sugars as temperature rises to the pyrolysis point. Now, what's the, what's the, 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 the difference here? If you look at the structure down below, then you see here glucose as a sugar molecule and you see fructose. Both, both is, is the, 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 the chemical formula and ring of, of sucrose. So there is this connection, which is the glycosidic bond, which is the one here in between. These two legs here, they're so busy, they're holding on to this glycosidic bond and, and they do not have another aldehyde, which would be another electron that they would be able to donate that is not available for them. So it's a non-reducing sugar, which is defined by this glycosidic bond and as, as glucose and fructose combined defining sucrose as sugar that doesn't play a role within the myelot reaction, but plays a role in the caramelization. Here's the, 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 the so-called brother, the opposite. Here we have a reducing sugar, which basically shows this leg to hydrogen from the carbon to and a double in a double uh, connection to oxygen. These are the these are the most important structures, and that means they can share, they can donate an electron to as a reducing agent to an, an, um, an, an another molecule, and there's the difference between ketone and aldose, and what it means, I mean, it's coming out of fructose, mannose, and glucose. This sugar, this sugar is a very important sugar. It has a free aldehyde group or con con a ketone functional group, and that plays a role, the major role in the myelite reaction. Now, we need one more component in order to make the myelite reaction working for us, and these are the amino acids. Now, amino acids, they are the building blocks of life. And we have about 20 amino acids, which you see here on the left. 20 of those amino acids are available, um, and they are proteins, and they are ready to inter interface or ready to work with the reducing sugars uh, with the aldehyde group. Both now were taken into the myelite reaction. And here is a more simplified form, and, and I'm working on, on another way of showing this. The myelite reaction is a cascade chemical reaction, and it is not, it's very complicated. It's, also, it's not easy to communicate. Uh, however, 
in vision, for example, you come down with the reduced sugar and the amino acid sugar, and you put heat to them, which you do in, in the in the in the roaster. We're applying we're applying convective and conductive energy, and we're causing these chemical reactions to happen. We have to, the we have the free water has been evaporated inside the beans. We have temperatures over 100 degrees C and going higher. The pressure builds up. We have substances and organic uh, substances uh, uh, being trans transferred in the mean. That little bean becomes the reactor. Yes, we're dissipating. We're allowing bean uh, uh, steam to dissipate. However, it is it is it is the the the, the, the shell will not give in, but it will basically grow. It will swell in order to make room for the steam. And, and certainly the, the reactions to happen, the CO2 to develop, but with the sugar and the amino acids and adding this heat, we're causing all these flavors on the right-hand side. Now, take it like this, for example, you put sugar, in mission, you have down there a conveyor belt, and you put on the conveyor belt in the desert, there's a receiver and you're putting sugar and amino acids and you run in the conveyor belt to an, uh, an, an, an oven, and on the other side, you're rolling out. You're rolling out all these flavors and aromas that you find uh, for sure in our coffee. Uh, when, you, when you grill or barbecue a steak, when you brew beer, when you uh, grill bacon, and certainly anything that is there's heat applied to protein, um, uh, that you know, that you're familiar with is being created. And if you look at down there, you have all those flavor components, the pyrazines that are being developed during this process. So the Mylod reaction is, is a non-enzymatic process uh, or browning process. During this entire process, we're creating browning compounds, which are called melanoidines. And they're a reddish brown color that is being created. To, uh, they're created during this process, and it's not enzymatic. It is not like and that means without oxygen. It's not the the same enzymatic process that you are familiar with when you take an apple or you take a, a potato and you cut it in half and you put it on the table and expose it to oxygen and it turns brown. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the browning. The non-browning uh, or the, the non-enzymatic browning effect that happens in the roaster with with uh, no oxygen. In order to complete this, this is only this is only the browning, the non-enzymatic browning process that we're uh, uh, talking about. We need um, we need also to understand that on this way, we are going through this phase of the saccharides with the amino compounds, peptides, proteins, from which reactive multifunction intermediate products develop. However, there are intermediate products, uh, products too, which are the Amadori products through a rearrangement. I'm coming back to the four uh, uh, chemical reactions that have to be understood, but these rearrangement, they're rising other products from decatones, Furanos, furans, and pyrazines, and others. And last but not least, there's also the the the, the Heinz uh, uh, products uh, that are intermediate uh, uh, com compounds um, that develop uh, the flavors and aromas, and at the same time uh, contribute to the uh, 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 change of browning. With the melanoidins, and here you have like this structure that is what we call the the, the cascade structure of the uh, um, flavors and aroma precursors from sugar to amino acids, but it also we're adding trigonoline as the the alkaloid, and we're getting into the chlorogenic acids pretty soon. But all of this is happening during the uh, myelite reaction. One more component that is missing here that is not have not been addressed, that is the so-called striker degradation. What happens here now, we have new products developed within the in the, the myelite reaction, and 
And the Strecker degradation is now, it involves the amino acids again, but instead reacting with sugar, it's breaking, uh, it's reacting with the molecules of the two carbonyl groups. So the compounds beginning to trade parts among themselves, ketones, which, which create a buttery caramel flavor, key aromas like raspberry and grapefruit. And, and last but not least, the Strecker aldehyde itself. And this is the Strecker degradation also yields pyrazines and earthy roasting notes of the coffee aroma. Um, in, in a little bit more of a chemical um, definition, you see it here again with the aldehyde group, the Strecker degradation aldehyde with H2O and with the flavor compounds um, um, that together with the Amador enhanced product uh, provide at the end the, the flavor and aroma that we perceive and appreciate in, the, in, a, in a cup of coffee. Here is the, the amino acids uh, defined that contribute with the Strecker uh, aldehyde development to those odor descriptors. The green, uh, an overripe fruit, the malty, the fruity, the to toasted, like toasted bread. And then you see here the relative, I mean, the, the, the relation to the one on the other. Um, and certainly this is information is available that we can share uh, for people that are interested. Uh, to know that. Here, just to reference amino acid, once not used in a Maillard reaction through oxidized, here again, the oxidation process, which basically delivers an, 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 uh, an electron and then, and then the, creates there the aldehydes uh, that we then appreciate and are converted in flavor and aroma compounds. Um, Organic or the organic acids, organic acids, mainly the chlorogenic acids, which is uh, the most important um, uh, acid within the within the organic acids family, and that were listed here: quinic acid, citric acid, malic acid, and so forth. Uh, the the organic acid, the chlorogenic acid, but also citric and malic, uh, caffeic, they are all non-volatile. Now, why do we say that they're all non-molotides? Because you're going to find them in the cup. They're going to go through the cup. Thermal decomposition, again, here's the word. We're going to come back to the four most important chemical reactions and a number of factors during the roasting. Roaster type, airflow, we're going to talk that a little bit more later. Um, airflow play an incredible role by um, breaking these these organic acids down to their degree. And there's, there's where roasting, there's where the roast master comes in. There's where the, the, the roaster, the, 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 the performance of the roaster is, is, uh, is uh, uh, shows, would show itself. Um, and I'm not saying one of the roaster type. Yes, there's a difference between a drum roaster and tangential roasters and fluid bed roasters. There's a difference between airflow, high airflow, Low, high airflow, lower temperature, lower airflow, higher temperature, and so forth. But during this process, these organic acids are being, I mean, broken down and degraded. But they leave certain nuances in the cup because they're non-volatile. Citric acid is known for citrus acidic acids, vinegar, malic is the green apple acid, and phosphoric acid, I have to say here, this is not an organic acid, but that contributes to sweetness or a sweeter coffee. And I'm, we're coming back to this too, because phosphoric acid is, an, is a very interesting uh, component. If you like to go more into the, into the chemical structures of those, and you're looking at chlorogenic acid, which is breaking down during the process into quinic acid, uh, through heat and into caffeic acid. Um, and then we're looking at all of them. Where are they, where, in, in more details, where do these acidic, acidic 
uh, or assets playing a role? In, in what of these categories are they playing a role? Now, for here, sour, chlorogenic acid. If it breaks down in quinic and caffeic acid, now, if we're not, if we're running too fast in the roasting profile while we're going up to the first crack and we're running through fast to this moment where we're breaking down chlorogenic acid into quinic and, and, and uh, caffeic acid, then our, our cup is basically coming out a little bit too sour because we're leaving more, more acidity back, the chlorogenic acidity in the coffee cup. So that's a, it's a trick. To, to, to run through this moment, to this place, depending on the different coffees you're roasting or processing, it is a trick to how do we ideally and best convert the, 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 the uh, chlorogenic acid in the quinic acid. Quinic acid is more stable. And, and I'm sure everybody of us has, has experienced that, that when a late afternoon we're walking into a coffee shop and there's a coffee pot sitting uh, on a coffee, hot coffee plate. And what are we getting? What, what is the perception that we're getting when we're, when we first of all, there's a sour taste. That is, for example, if, if you will, I mean, this is quinic acid that basically that's for coffee that sits there for so long, but that sensation is basically the, uh, the, the, the quinic acid. And here again, lactic acid that we, that is being uh, uh, created and, and, and generated, but also degraded. Quinic acid, the acid of cranberry, citric acid of, of, of citrus, uh, the acid of uh, the, the vinegar, the acidic acid is, is created during uh, the, the process, the, the roasting process. However, it's coming from the fermentation process uh, and, and, and then it's being created during the roasting process. Caffeic acid, we talked about, and malic acid, the acid of the apple, uh, uh, as well. And here is how they, uh, what we know, how they, how they basically degrade during the roasting process in, in, in those crafts. They're built up at the time to a certain point, and then they're being degraded. The same thing with the citric acid. Here's the development of acidic acid that comes with, the, comes already with the coffee, is being created at, at any point in time. Uh, it is uh, has a, have a very strong note, but it's also de uh, 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 degraded. Trigonolin, that's the process of trigonolin as an alkaloid. Um, the longer the roast, um, the more it is being broken down. Um, here we have the trigonolin in pyridines and the nicotinic acid, which is a, a positive, uh, uh, from a health point of view, uh, has a positive impact. Um, um, in, in, in the coffee, and then and then again, where do these flavor compounds and aromas where do they land uh, within in these taste profiles, and and how do we do this? as cuppers? We're trying to find out what are we perceiving by elimination, um, by elimination, and when we and we go to. The, the uh, trigonoline as an alkaloid, obviously the bitterness, and that also includes the, the, the caffeine, they contribute to the bitterness um, uh, perception um, when cupping a, a cup of coffee. And again, it is up to the cupper to determine what type of bitterness are we picking up in this, in this, in this, uh, in, in this, in a, in a cup of coffee. Uh, here is caffeine. Not spe specifically uh, pointed out in, in, in the segment, uh, but um, very important uh, to understand. Now, here we just as a summary: caffeine as the alkaloid with intense bitter taste defense me mechanism. Taste compounds is bitter and sour. The forbid uh, caffeine can contribute about thirty percent responsible for, uh, and the rest is caused by the products in the myelite reaction. That's where bitterness is coming from. Sour is coming from acidic or citrus, malic, phosphoric responsibility. The volatiles, I mean, obviously, what gives aroma and flavor formed and, and, and retained in the, in, the, in, the, in the cell structure, they're mostly aldehydes and ketones from protein, an important amount of sulfides from certain proteins. 
volatile substance, it's, it's uh, they're vaporized, they have higher vapor pressure at room temperatures. Um, we, we, the pyrolysis, we, we basically skipped this here for a bit and we, we're going to come back to, to this uh, as much as the caramelization, uh, we'll see that later. When we do the roast, when we're roasting a cup of coffee, what we're teaching um, in, in, in our roasting uh, classes is here what we're roasting um, is, is um, uh, the, the, the specialty curve which basically uh, takes uh, from the charging temperature, the, the rate of rise, the turning point, the first crack, the development time, uh, all of those at the midpoint time, all of these are uh, 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 parameters that we're roasting and, and we um, talking about, and as a summarize, what we have done so far with creating those 800 to 1000 different aroma compounds. Uh, we're creating the mylar reaction, the Strecker degradation, the amino acid breakdown, the degradation of trigonomin, the, the uh, degradation of the chlorogenic acid, the phenols, ox oxidation of lipids, and the interaction of all of the above. This is what we have touched so far. Um, um, I seeing the, the time, but I need to point out uh, a little bit more for where we're going. Everything, everything that has been discussed right now with all developing these, these flavors and aromas, what you see there in front of it is, is, a, is an, a summary of what happens during the roast. Now, during the first time, we're talking about an endothermic phase. We're coming around the turning point. We endothermic means we're adding heat energy into the coffee. This is the drying phase. This is so important to know the finding the right ratio between convection and conductive. The more convection, the faster you're drying out the bean, the faster you're running through the chemical reactions. You need to have that right ratio between conductive and convection uh, ratio in order to do to do the right thing. Now, what happens to it the first in the first 260? The sucrose, the 70%, begins to degrade rapidly, decompose. And in light roast, 90% is lost. First through dehydration and followed by hydrolyzation and reducing to the reducing sugars. You make to the next step, you get to the, the first to the 309, uh, 309 degrees F where the mylar reaction starts. It's not where it finished, where it starts. It causes free proteins to continue with reducing sugars to form the uh, hundreds of aromatic com compounds such as furans and sweet caramel notes. We're growing on 320, caramelization starts. More tightly, the water is driven off. Trigonoline decomposes, including or formation of CO2, H2, and large class of arom aromatic compounds called the pyridines. We're going on to 130 or for 335. Free water evaporates. Loose chaff is coming off. Loss, the, the loss of organic matter, such as the carbon monoxide and, and carbon dioxide, is lost first. And coffee begins to yellow. 356. Pyrolysis started. Here's this pyrolysis. This is now pyrolysis. We're, we're taking something down by, by temperature. We're breaking. Uh, substances down, chemical reactions down by temperature. 380, the first pop, of course, could be 390, the first pop, depending on the coffee. Pyrolysis has begun, beans pass through the class trans, uh, transition temperature. That's a very important, I mean, transition takes a little bit longer to explain, but water, CO, and CO2 causing the first pop. Most water is gone, caffeine begins to sublim from roasting bean. Volume doubles in size. This is where now the swelling starts, and uh, and uh, and, and the, the e easily the, the bean becomes a double in size. 410 coffee burns become exotherm. Pyrolysis is in full swing. VOCs, volatile organic compounds, are emanating from coffee. Blue gray haze appears. Proteins are being consumed and denatured. 
in the myelite reactions. Sugars are being consumed. The larger pyrolysis, is, the longer the pyrolysis is allowed to go, fraction in the bean cell wall in larger pores allow. Now, what we had at the beginning, go back to the to, to the to polysaccharides, which basically contribute to the bean itself, the, making it this converter that holds the pressure. We which is a very organized structure. Now when we're done, this, this structure is porous. Um, water has been taken out. Oils are moving around. Cavities have been created and are now filled with CO2. And we know we're building up the pressure and this pressure that can be easily go to like eight atmosphere. Not that we're able to measure that with a gauge. No, we know how much, uh, what, uh, how much uh, uh, the substance are being converted into carbon monoxide and creating this pressure inside the bean. And, that's, and, and we go on. We go on. 410 cellulose breaks down apart and reacts with protein parts from humic acid. Pyrolysis or chemical decomposition of sucrose from aldehydes are also appealing. Aromas, flavor, development depend on how the pyrolysis is allowed to go to proceed. Now, you're by way now in that doing that roast in the exothermic uh, phase of the of, of this uh, of the roasting process. Carbon dioxide gas, gases, aldehydes, ketones, acidic acid, which are volatized from the beans at that time. And then quinic and caffeic acid occur around the first pop when the beans undergo the physical uh, change. Citric acid is not created during the roasting but slowly decomposes over the time um, and so forth. Important is that once you reach this point, this is, this is here the aroma development. This is the development phase in the exotherm phase. At, but at the same time, as long as the roast goes, the longer the roast goes, the lower the acidity, but the higher the bitterness. That's important to understand for, for roast in particular, for people that get into the roasting business, um, um, that, that is very, a very important development. Now, and look at the, the entire roasted coffee chemistry, the aromatic com compounds. Here's the green beans with its total of 100%, 26% becomes soluble. The majority of the soluble stuff is also, is basically what you find as ground coffee uh, from the cellular structure of the beans. But look at the impact of the non-volatile acids, which are basically ending up in the cup and, and, and the organic acids, and, and certainly the alkaloids, relatively low comparing to what we begin with and, and, and what impact they have on, on the quality of the cup. Now, we have here... Uh, uh, we have here the, the, the pH. I'm just making reference to the to pH, which is the power of hydrogen, because that's the way we're measuring the acidity. Because when we go into, into cupping, and, and, and we know the darker we roast, the sweeter the coffee. But when we're really looking for something very special in the, in a, in the lighter or medium roast, we're looking for the clean acidity in the cup. Now we have all of, of those various acidities uh, that, um, that, we, that we have talked about. Citric acid, chlorogenic acid, malic acid, acidic acid, caffeic acid, quinic acid. We have all of them. It's, not, it's impossible for us to pick any of them particularly. We can only get a sensation of all of them. And then, and then we can, in a way of determine if what the what the acidity is, how the, the, the fruitiness is, and and the sweetness and the bitterness is, but there is one one very important ma mathematical term that we need to know, which is or we need to define, which is the pKa. Now the pKa mathematically is is a is a, is a uh, definition of the ne negative logarithm. I'm not going to go into this, but we're looking at the key PA as a component in measuring, and that tells us what the acidity in a coffee solution, in a coffee cup, has to be in order to emphasize the one or other acidities that we have developed during the roast. 
And it came to find out that if you look at the, K, the PKI factors on, on this chart, um, the lower the chart, the lower this PKI factor, the higher it, it is, see it as an, a disassociate uh, factor, but the lower this factor is, the higher the emphasis, the, high, the strength of this acidity being recognized in, in this cup of coffee. And if you go through all of them, quinic acid, 353, lactic acid, citric acid, acetic acid, malic acid, the lowest is phosphoric acid. And phosphoric acid is not something that we, um, that, that, that is, it's not an organic acid. It's something that comes out of the soil. And we came to find out that you're really in a cup of coffee, if you want to put the sparkle into the cup of this nice, beautiful, I call it the Pinot Grigio acidity, you got to have that phosphoric acid, I mean, in a way developed so that you can pick it up in your cup of coffee. That is, this is a very important mathematical term to be, look, to be looked at in order to measure the strength of, of acidity and at the same time, what the strength has to be in order to make it a sparkle cup of coffee. So finally, we, we, we have several flavor forming substances that presented from the beginning. We added heat to them and we're gonna get a certain development of, of substances out of them. And if we go back here, then you see this out of the green bean, what we were able to do and adding the minerals, we haven't done a whole lot to the minerals. Caffeine, we haven't done a lot to that. Free amino acids, we took care of pretty well. Aroma that we converted and created. Simple sugars that we converted. The organic acids that we, yeah, I mean, use pretty well. Chlorogenic acids for sure. Arabinogalactan, which came out of the carbohydrates we used and converted. Manan, another one out of the out of the uh, um, out of the carbohydrates, and then the browning effect. And we all know myelite reaction. We all know where it came from. The proteins, and last but not least, the cellulose, uh, lignin, and oils. And we haven't done a whole lot to that. But this is what we converted during the roasting process. And in, in the summary, here we have green coffee in the bar craft. And you can see basically what we created with, acidity, with various organic acidities, but including the phosphoric acid as well. And this in comparison to numbers that has been created um, by Dr. Illy many, many years ago. And we have the, the we know when we don't want uh, coffee with a higher acidity, we have to roast slower because we want to carry a little bit more uh, of the chlorogenic acid over the aroma of the flavors, which is the blue line here. It's got to be a little bit slower body, a little bit longer and dark roast in flavor, certainly longer as well. And I talked earlier about when we looked at the, the structure of the beans, the green beans as a, as a uh, very f uh, organized structure in its cell structure um, uh, to the point of acting as a converter uh, in this process. And when we're done with everything, that's what you're looking at. Those cavity that we created that are filled with gas or CO2 the water that has been replaced, the, the oil that we moved around, all of that is what is what is basically when we're cutting through the bean at the end after roasting and that's left. A bean, a bean, a roasted bean with a pressure inside of can go basically up to, to, to over 10, 12 bar or atmosphere. Um, and if you're grinding it, if you take this, when you take this coffee and you put it on the on the table and, and you let it sit there and exposed to to the atmospheric oxygen, it will take about it will take about 21 days until that pressure inside the bean 
has reached equilibrium to the outside atmosphere. Now, if you take that same coffee and you cut it down and you grind it down and you put it down on, on, the, on the table, it will be reaching that same equilibrium within six hours. So uh, because of the higher uh, for surface area, but each and every particle in the, in the particles uh, uh, size distribution when you're grinding it still holds that much pressure. It's just the surface areas has increased and and um, the, 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 the coffee can be gassing faster. Thank you very much.